The much anticipated June 16 meeting between President Joe Biden and President Vladimir Putin is taking place amid sanctions, possible election interference, and accusations of hacking and human rights violations. This is President Putin's first substantive interview since President Biden was elected and his first US media interview for almost three years. We met him inside the walls of the Kremlin. Mr. President, it's been a long time since you sat down with an American television network. Thank you for your time. So let's talk about uh, your uh, meeting uh, with President Biden. <clears throat> President Biden asked you to meet with him. He didn't make any preconditions. Were you surprised? Yet. No. We have a bilateral relationship that has deteriorated to what is the lowest point in recent years. However, there are matters that need a certain amount of comparing notes and identification and uh, determination of mutual positions so that matters that are of mutual interest can be dealt with in an efficient and effective way in the interests of both the United States and Russia. President Biden wants predictability and stability. Is that what you want? Well, these are the most important things. This is the most important thing. This is the most important value, if you will, in international affairs. S sorry to interrupt you, but he would say that you have caused a lot of instability and unpredictability. Well, he says one thing, I say another thing. But maybe at some point, in certain ways, our rhetoric varies and is different. But if you ask my opinion now, I'm telling you what it is. The most important value in international affairs is predictability and stability. Uh, President Biden is, is not President Trump. Uh, you once described President Trump as a bright person, talented. How would you describe President Biden? No, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, even now, I believe that former U.S. President Mr. Trump is an extraordinary individual, talented individual. Otherwise, he would not have become U.S. president. He's a colorful individual. You may like him or not. But he didn't come from the U.S. establishment. He had not been part of big-time politics before. President Biden, of course, is radically different from Trump because President Biden is a career man. He has spent virtually his entire adulthood in politics. That's a different kind of person. And it is my great hope that, yes, there are some advantages, some disadvantages, but there will not be any knee-jerk reactions on behalf of the sitting U.S. president. Mr. President, there is now a weight of evidence, a long list of alleged state-sponsored cyber attacks. Let me give you five. There's a lot, but it makes a point. Uh, the U.S. intelligence community says Russia interfered with the 2016 election. Election security officials said Russia tried to interfere with the 2020 election. Cybersecurity researchers said government hackers targeted COVID vaccine researchers, hacking for COVID vaccines. In April, the Treasury Department said the SolarWinds attack was the world's worst, with, including not, with targets including nine federal agencies. And just before your summit, Microsoft says it's discovered another attack with targets including organizations that have criticized you, uh, Mr. Putin. Mr. Pres President, are you waging a cyber war against America? Dear Kier, you have said that there is a weight of evidence of uh, cyber attacks by Russia. And then you went on to list those official U.S. agencies that have stated as much. Is that what you did? Well, I'm, telling, I'm giving you information about who said it so you can answer. Da. Right. Right. You are conveying information to me as to who said that, but where is evidence that this was indeed done? I will tell you that this person has said that and that person has said this, but where is the evidence? Next time they will say there was an attack against some Easter eggs. It's becoming farcical, like an ongoing farcical thing, a never-ending farcical thing. 
The US intelligence community has produced evidence of Russian hackers targeting the federal government and meddling in US elections. And this year, the US has seen multiple criminal ransomware attacks extorting millions of dollars. Russian-speaking criminals, is the allegation, are targeting the American way of life, food, gas, water, hospitals, uh, transport. Uh, why would you let Russian-speaking criminals disrupt your diplomacy? Wouldn't, don't you want to know who's responsible? You know, the simplest thing to do would be for us to sit down calmly and agree on joint work in cyberspace. There are grounds to believe that we can build an effort in this area with the new administration. We hope that the domestic political situation in the United States will not prevent this from happening. We here in the Russian Federation have a cybercrime that has increased many times over in the last few years. We're trying to respond to it. We're looking for cyber criminals. If we find them, we punish them. We are willing to engage with international participants, including the United States. You are the ones who have refused to engage in joint work. What can we do? We cannot build this work. We cannot structure this work unilaterally. I'm not the government, Mr. Putin. I'm just a journalist asking I understand you, that. Uh, questions. But Russia has been accused of violating existing international cyber agreements. In our interview, the Russian leader admitting to NBC News he is concerned that the US can target Russia. You clearly want to negotiate. You must have something to negotiate with. You, you don't ask for a truce unless you're fighting in a war. You know, as far as the war, NATO, officially, I'd like to draw your attention to that. NATO has officially stated that it considers cyberspace a battlefield, an area of military action. And you're involved in that battlefield. Russia is fighting on that battlefield, correct? No, no, no. Really? That is not correct. Really? If we wanted to do that, NATO did say that it considers cyberspace an area of combat. And it prepares and even conducts exercises. What stops us from doing the same? If you do that, we will do the same thing. But we don't want that. Just like we don't want space militarized, in the same manner, we don't want cyberspace militarized. Do you fear that uh, American intelligence is deep inside Russian systems and has the ability to do you a lot of damage in cyber? I'm not afraid, but I bear in mind that it is a possibility. In February, Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny was jailed after a flight to Moscow. The month before, Navalny was poisoned with the nerve agent Novichok and almost died. He blamed the Russian government, but officials denied any involvement. Thousands of Russians across the country protested Navalny's arrest. Did you order Alexei Navalny's assassination? Of course not. We don't have this kind of habit of assassinating anybody. Will you commit that you will personally ensure that Alexei Navalny will leave prison alive? <laughs> Look, such decisions in this country are not made by the president. They're made by the court, whether or not to set somebody free. As far as the health, all individuals who are in prison, that is something that the administration of the specific prison or penitentiary establishment is responsible for. And there are medical facilities in penitentiaries that are perhaps not in the best condition, and they are the ones whose responsibility it is, and I hope that they do it properly. And I proceed from the premise that the person that you have mentioned, the same kind of measures will apply to that person, not in any way worse than to anybody else who happens to be in prison. His name is Alexei Navalny. People will note that you were prepared care. to say I don't that care. he would leave pas prison alive. Pas pas look, 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 please listen to me carefully. His name can be anything. He's one of the individuals who are in prison. For me, he's one of the citizens of the Russian Federation who has been found guilty by a court of law and is in prison. There are many citizens like that. Let me ask you another direct question that you uh, can answer, and it's an allegation that has been made, an accusation that has been made again and again now uh, in the United States. Uh, the late John McCain uh, in Congress called you a killer. When President Trump was asked, uh, was told that you are a killer, he didn't deny it. 
when President Biden was asked whether he believes you are a killer, he said, I do. Mr. President, are you a killer? <laughs> Look, over my tenure, I've gotten used to attacks from all kinds of angles, and from all kinds of directions, under all kinds of pretexts and reasons, and of different caliber and fierceness. And none of it surprises me. People with whom I work and with whom I argue on the international arena, we're not bride and groom. We don't swear everlasting love and friendship. We are partners. And in some areas, we are rivals. As far as harsh rhetoric, I think that this is an expression of overall U.S. culture. I don't think I heard you answer the question, the direct question, uh, Mr. President. I did answer. I did. I will add, if you let me. I have heard dozens of such accusations, especially during the period of some grave events during our counterterrorism efforts in North Caucasus. And when it happens, I'm always guided by the interests of the Russian people and the Russian state. And sentiments in terms of who calls somebody what, what kind of labels, this is not something I worry about in the least. Let me give you some names. Anna Polakovskaya, shot dead. Alexander Litvinenko, poisoned by polonium. Uh, Sergei Magnitsky, allegedly beaten and died in prison. Boris Nemtsov, shot moments from the Kremlin, moments from here. Uh, Mikhail Lessin uh, died of uh, blunt trauma in Washington, D.C. I mean, are all of these a coincidence, Mr. President? <laughs> Look, you know, I don't want to come across as being rude, but this looks like some kind of indigestion, except that it's verbal indigestion. You mentioned many individuals who indeed suffered and perished at different points in time for various reasons, at the hand of different individuals. We found some of the criminals who committed those crimes, and some are in prison, and we are prepared to continue to work in this mode and uh, along this avenue, identifying everybody who violate the law and by their actions cause damage, including to the image of the Russian Federation. However, just piling everything together is meaningless, inappropriate, and baseless. If one sees this as a line of attack, then very well. Let me listen to it one more time. But I repeat, I have heard it many times, but this doesn't baffle me. Just weeks before our interview, a commercial airliner was forced to land in Belarus, and a journalist, Roman Protasevich, was arrested. Days later, Vladimir Putin appeared, smiling alongside the leader of Belarus, often described as Europe's last dictator. Uh, did you have prior knowledge that a commercial airliner would be forced to land in Belarus and that a, a journalist would be arrested? <laughs> no, I did not know about this. I didn't know about any airliner. I didn't know about the individuals who were detained there subsequently. I found out about it from the media. I didn't know. I didn't have a clue about any detainees. I don't know. It is of no interest to us. You appeared to approve of it, uh, judging by your meeting with President Lukashenko soon afterwards. Not that I approve of it, not that I condemn it, but the version of Mr. Lukashenko who told me about it. He said that information had been given to them, that there was an explosive device on board the plane. They informed the pilot without forcing the pilot to land, and the pilot made a decision to land in Minsk. That is all. And you believe that? Why should I not believe him? The Biden administration has said that in your, at your summit they will bring up uh, the case of two U.S. prisoners in Russia, um, Paul Whelan and Trevor Reed. Uh, they are two former uh, Marines. Uh, Trevor Reed uh, is uh, suffering from uh, COVID in prison. Uh, why don't you release them ahead of the summit? Wouldn't that show goodwill? I know that we have certain U.S. citizens who are in prison, have been convicted, but if one considers the number of Russian Federation citizens who are in U.S. prisons, then these numbers don't even compare. Your guy, the Marine, he's just a drunk and a troublemaker. As uh, they say here, he got himself faced on vodka and started a fight. As far as possible negotiations on this subject, sure, it can be talked about, Obviously, it will raise the matter of our citizens in prison in the United States. Yes, it can be a specific conversation, sure. So his family will find that incredibly distressing to hear you talk about him that way.
There is nothing offensive about it. He got drunk on vodka and started a fight. He fought a cop. There is nothing offensive about it. These things happen in life. There is nothing horrible about it. It happens to our men as well. Somebody gulps down some vodka and starts a fight. So you violate the law, you go to prison. Trevor Reed's parents, Joey and Paula, told NBC News that President Putin's well, comments were surprising. Um, the statement was very offensive and untrue. You know, we, we've never made any negative comments about President Putin. Uh, we think that's a political issue and, and not for us. And on the prisoner swap question, is that something that you would consider? Are you looking to negotiate? You're the, meeting with the president? Yes, 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 of course, of course. Which Russian prisoners in the US would you be hoping to bring back to Russia by name? Well, we have a whole list. A pilot named Yaroshenko who was taken to the US from a third country and was given a rather lengthy sentence. He has some serious health issues, but the prison administration is not paying attention to this. Konstantin Yaroshenko was convicted of drug smuggling and is in a US jail. Secretary of State Blinken said the Americans are being held in Russia as political pawns. I want to ask you about China. China refused to take part in arms control talks last year. You complain so much about NATO to your west. Why do you never complain about China's militarization to your east? The first thing I want to say is that over the last few years, the last few decades, we have developed a strategic partnership relationship between Russia and China that previously had not been achieved in the history of our two nations. A high level of trust and cooperation, and in all areas, in politics, in the economy, in technology, and in the area of military and technical cooperation. We do not believe that China is a threat to us. That's one. China is a friendly nation. It has not declared us an enemy, as the United States has done. China has been developing, and I understand that what's beginning to happen is a certain, well, certain kind of confrontation with China. That is why what you said, that China won't engage in negotiations, arms control. It refuses to negotiate reductions in nuclear offensive weapons. You should ask the Chinese about it, whether it's good or bad. It's up to them. Are you splitting off from the U.S. space program and moving forward with China? No. No. Why would you say that? We are prepared to work with the U.S. in space. Because the, the head of the Russia space agency has threatened uh, leaving the International Space Program in 2025 and specifically talked about sanctions um, in relation to that threat. Well, honestly, I do not think that Mr. Rogozin, which is the name of the head of Roscosmos, has threatened anyone in this regard. I've known him for many years and I know that he is a supporter of expanding the relationship with the United States in this area, in space. The cooperation between our two countries in space is a great example of a situation where, despite any kinds of problems in political relationships in recent years, it is an area where we have been able to maintain and preserve the partnership, and both parties cherish it. We have been working and will continue to work with China, which applies to all kinds of programs, including exploring deep space and I think there is nothing but positive information here. Frankly, I don't see any contradictions here. Mr. President, you extended the Constitution so that you could be president of, of Russia until 2036. Do you worry that the longer you are in power and without any sign of someone to replace you, the more instability there may be when you finally do choose to leave office? Of course, somebody will come and replace me at some point. On the political arena, different people may emerge with different points of view. Well, great, very good. You know, I have linked my entire life to the fate of my country to such an extent that there isn't a more meaningful goal in my life than the strengthening of Russia. It is a natural biological process at some point Naturally, someday, we will all be replaced. You will be replaced at where you are, I will be replaced at where I am, but I am confident that the fundamental pillar of 
the Russian economy and statehood and its political system will be such that Russia will be firmly standing on its feet and look into the future confidently. And would you look from that person for some kind of protection the same way that you offered to Boris Yeltsin when you took over? I'm not even thinking about that. These are third-tier issues. The most important thing, the single most important thing, is the fate of this country and the fate of its people. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. President. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.